let's have a look at ring signatures and we'll do some some basics around them about the basic principles and then we'll actually look how they're going to be used in cryptocurrencies and within blockchain methods. So the whole idea behind uh, ring signatures is that is it possible to have a trusted set of signers that are able to sign a message and it's not able to tell which of the entities within inside the trust infrastructure actually signed the message. So the example that was given in the original paper is a leak of uh, some sensitive information from the White House. So in this case, uh, the person uh, within the White House could actually find out that something had been leaked and the leak had came from one of the trusted entities but it was not possible to actually determine which one it was. In this case all of the public keys are well defined for each of the entities within inside the infrastructure. The secret keys will stay as uh, stay with the entities and should obviously never be released. The method that we'll see that's used is to be able to fake the secret keys for each of the entities apart from the actual signer. The signer then uses a trapdoor function to be able to validate his secret key. So this is how ring signatures actually work. Basically what happens is that we go around a loop and at the very end we end up with the original value. But only knowing the right entities can we actually end up with this original value. So what happens is that each of the entities have a public and a private or secret key. We'll define that as capital P and capital S. So Trent has P1, S1, Bob has P2, S2, and so on. Then what we do is that we then uh, find the asymmetric key encryption method and then we encrypt as we go around the loop. The encryption key, as we'll find, is based on a hash of the message that we're sending. We then use the exclusive or function to exclusive or the values together. What we do here is that the signer will fake the secret keys of each of the entities involved and create a random value and then go around and sign the message. But with their own secret key, they will find what's called a trapdoor function to be able to uh, reset all of the random values and for the whole of the of the signature to be validated. Okay, so the basics that we have here is to use uh, public key encryption, symmetric encryption, and the XOR function. And then eventually we'll end up with the same value that we started with. The original paper was created by Ron Rivest and others and implemented the RSA method. It's not used these days because RSA isn't an efficient method in public key encryption and we typically move towards elliptic curve cryptography which is much more efficient and can scale better with smaller keys. But the example we'll give is with the RSA method because it's quite easy to show uh, the implementation. Okay, so I hope you remember what we actually did there and how we're using the keys. Remember, Bob is signing, but we don't. he doesn't want his signature to be seen that he has actually signed the message. <coughs> but for the group to, to know that it's been signed, even someone in the group cannot tell which of the entities actually signed the message. So here is the method and how it's created. 
it might take a little bit to actually understand this, but it's quite an interesting technique. We start off with a random seed value of uh, u. We then generate the encryption key, which is the hash of the message that we're going to sign for. We start off with a v value, and we'll go through the v value for each of the entities apart from the signer and fake their secret key. So we start by encrypting u as v. We then go round and we take a fake random key for Bob's, for Trent's uh, key here. And we raise it to the power of p1, which is equivalent to en encrypting uh, the value. We raise it to the power of v1, take the, the, the mod of the n value for the keys that uh, Bob has. So Bob also has a modulus value, n1. And this here, I've not shown it, but there is a modulus in there of n1. And then we exclusive or with the value that we've just received for v. v then goes into the next stage, the next stage from here, goes into there. And now we take Eve's fake secret key, and we raise it to the power of her public key, and we exclusive for it with a V again, as we've seen with our with our loop. That becomes our new V, and we feed that into the next stage, which is now Alice. We take a fake key for Alice, we raise it to the power of her public key, and then we XOR with the value that we've got for V, we end up with V. Now at the end of it, Bob takes uh, the resultant uh, v value and exclusive or is it with u, our original value, and then takes, raises it to the power of his secret key. This is the trap door. So Bob takes his real secret key and uses it to raise it to the power of d. This is a trap door function. If we now raise this to the power of e, then our original value will, will be seen. That's how RSA actually works. So Bob now ends up with this value. He takes all the fake values and puts them in, and then he actually shows that this is his secret key. And he places that in there. So he hasn't revealed his private key or his decryption key in there. He also sends the message and the V value for someone else to be able to verify. On the other side, let's say we have Victor. So Victor now has to prove the signature. So he receives uh, the message, uh, the, v, the uh, V value, and then uh, he will go through the same stages. So he's, he's going to create, get the, the, the fake secret keys and also the one that he thinks is the, another fake secret key, which is this one here. So he goes through the, the steps that Bob has done uh, to be able to uh, get these values. He then takes the fake secret key, he rebuilds in the same way, he then does the same again with Trent's secret key, he does the same again there. He'll do it in a slightly different order, but it doesn't matter. So he'll do it in the order of that the keys are actually stacked. So the last thing we want to do is to put the secret key of the, the signer last or first, because obviously it will be found out. So the keys are in a random order as they're set, and it's not possible for Victor to find out who has substituted uh, their key or signed with their key. So we go through that and that, and because they have the same encryption key, it all comes out. And the thing about this is that it ends up with U exclusive odd with V, exclusive odd with V again, and out pops U at the very end. So in that way we create the, f the full uh, signature uh, for it. Okay, so if you remember that we send the secret keys in an order which really can't identify who actually signed it. Most of them 
All of them apart from one are the fake keys and the other one is the trap door uh, function. I hope that makes sense. So let's look at how this is actually implemented. So here we go. Um, here we go. Uh, this is where we create the encryption key here. Uh, we take a hash of our message and we'll store that. So then that all our operations here are done with respect to that uh, encryption key. This operator here is our exclusive or operator. So just remember that. This here is this to the power of this mod this. Okay, so that's equivalent to the function that we have over here. Here. Okay, so we calculate uh, our value of V here, and that it's there. And we're going to encrypt the value of U. Then we go around each of the secret keys that we have, that we have, and we'll use each of the public keys for the entities, and we'll use each of the moduluses to do this function here, here, and here. And each time round, we'll exclusive or up with the previous round, and we end up with that. At the very end, we'll identify Bob's part, because we ignore his part in here. We don't generate uh, his secret key, but we create a trapdoor, and a trapdoor is uh, V to the eight exclusive odd with U, and then we'll use uh, Bob's decryption key, or his, his trapdoor function, and we'll take it with respect to his modulus. So the moduluses will be known, the public keys will be known, this one here will not be known. So we send out uh, the cipher, or the, signed, the, the signature, the resultant signature, and also each of the secret keys. The secret keys are random values apart from Bob's, which is a trapdoor function. On the other side, when we uh, verify it, again we generate the, uh, the encryption key. And then what we do is that we do the same as we did on the other side. This time we're going to use all the public keys. So that's a public key there, and all of those are the public keys. So it's basically just doing the same as what Bob did, but we'll do them in some, in some sort of sequence, which does not reveal that it was Bob that actually did it. At the very end, we'll complete our loop, and we should get back to our original value, which is the hash of, uh, which is the encrypted value of U. That gives us V. If that checks out, then everything is, is fine. Okay, so I've got a little demonstrator that you can actually have a look at and try out. So we'll try one here. It just takes a little minute to, to generate. And here is our signature. Here is our secret key values. There are four in this case. So there are four entities. So I think it's this one here who's actually signed it. And at the very end, it's true. Okay, so it just implements the, the method that we actually uh, looked at. So why is this so significant uh, these days? Well, a major problem that we have with our Bitcoin network is that uh, we reveal so much of a transaction because we have a public blockchain. In this case, we identify the sender of the transaction, we identify the receivers in this case, and we identify the actual value of the transaction. So Bitcoin needs to know this because it needs to know that this entity has this at least this amount of Bitcoins in its uh, account before the miners can approve the transaction. But this is not good because somebody who identifies your identity can actually trace all the transactions that you've made and possibly trace who you're actually sending them to and also how much money that you have in your account. 
So this might be fine for publicly uh, available transactions such as the payment of a contract of, for a government uh, tender, uh, but it's not good for individuals. We also see some transactions as having multiple signatures uh, that might go from many to one or two. This is very inefficient on the, on the network and requires for all of those entities to be able to provide their keys and for their keys to be checked. What we need is a way that we can actually merge the signatures together within a certain group, such as your organization can have a, a group of public keys and then any entity within inside that group can actually sign on behalf of the whole group, but no one can tell which one actually signed it. In this case, we, we create uh, anonymity. So that SA method itself that was proposed uh, by Revest is not really efficient in modern systems. So our keys are moving towards 4,000 and 2,048 bits, 4,096 bits and so on. They are absolutely massive prime numbers and it's actually quite difficult to scale it, especially for IoT type devices. So Greg Maxwell created a new type of signing using elliptic curves and he used this method uh, here. This was then used by the Monero uh, cryptocurrency to implement anonymized uh, transactions. But there were a few little weaknesses in it and they've now moved towards the multi-layered linkable spontaneous anonymous group signature and it's given this more simpler name of Ring CT. Ring CT was rolled out in January 2017 and it was made mandatory for all transactions from September 2017. So it's one method that we can use. Monero uses other methods such as decoy addresses and, and so on. But we need to be able to address this issue about anonymization within inside our transactions to be able to put data onto a publicly available ledger without that, those details being seen. Just now what we do is that we tend to put the signature of the data onto there so that it can be traced back. But if, what if someone who owns the data deletes it and we need to get the data back again, it will not be possible to actually view it. So this is the infrastructure that we have with ring signatures. We have a group that have their public keys and identified as, as a group and any one of them can sign uh, for something, a message or a transaction and it's not possible to know which one was it but it is possible to know that someone in the group did actually sign it. And that's the concept behind written signatures. Okay, thank you.